Welcome to TRS Clips, where you'll find happiness through your own curiosity. We have very few doctors in our country. That's a yeah. very large statement, hyper simplified. Yeah. But I remember, I don't know whether the stats are the same. When I was in college and uh, my friends was trying to get into medical college, um, they had told me this that apparently only three percent of our full population had access to healthcare. I don't know if that number is the same right now. It would have definitely changed. I mean, uh, the the idea is right. I mean, we do have a dearth of doctors, especially at different levels. So we have um, basic grassroots level doctors, uh, where we call them as you know uh, primary care physicians. Uh, we have specialists, which are those who do master's degree, for example, internal medicine, ophthalmology, obstetrics and gynecology, and then we have super specialists. There are the ones who do MCH and DM degrees, for example, hepatology, gastroenterology, neurology. They are super specialists. So we have all of these doctors in the country, but we don't have enough of them catering to the needful population. As in, India is a very large country with a lot of people yes. from different social strata. Yes. So the rich people are getting access to healthcare, but majority of the population is not. Um, even if, see, I mean, uh, rich people can access healthcare anywhere. You know, it's not just India. And uh, we are mostly a middle class society in India and also uh, a very poor class also, which is predominating. Uh, it's not just about access to healthcare. It's about access to realistic healthcare. For example, the whole point of uh, the Indian system of medicine, I mean, I'm not talking about the traditional system, I'm talking about the medical system of India collapsing on itself is because we don't have uh, a realistic or a logical solution of the hierarchy. For example, I'm a hepatologist. So I'm trained in dealing with the most critically ill cirrhosis patients or very advanced liver disease patients. And that is where I want to focus because they are the patients who are in need of real specialist care. But in between, I have to see a lot of patients with simple fatty livers, uh, somebody who would just want to know about how to go about checking the liver and things like that, you know. So if, I mean, I, 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 I talk to and I uh, deal with all, all these kinds of patients in my practice. But imagine if there was a, a level of doctors, family medicine doctors or doctors who are you know, specialized in primary care, who can actually deal with this group of patients. For example, somebody needs a simple lifestyle change for fatty liver. No major medications required. Somebody who can just communicate that to the patient. So that patient will not come up to that super specialist level. It's taken care of there. Mm. So the burden of patients that are going up to the specialist level will reduce. Mm. In India, this is not happening. Because one thing is that people are more aware there are these super specialists. For example, uh, now doctors are more on social media. They are more approachable. Uh, people understand this doctor is in this specialty. So if there is a fatty liver person, he will come to me directly. You know, he will not go to a family medicine doctor to clear his doubts. So this confusion in the system is what is driving this uh, skewness of doctor patient ratio i mean if you actually i mean it's, it's like a library full of good books and uh, it's all the sections are messed up mm. you need to actually arrange the books in the right sections so that people can understand where to go actually which is why uh, the systems abroad in the us and europe they have this but the problem is that it's too restrictive so somebody who actually has a real problem may not be able to actually go to a specialist on time so there's a huge in backlog the US. in the US and the UK. This is what happens. So there are bad and good to this kind of a system. And I'm not sure how we are going to put it in balance. But at least getting the patients to where they really belong mm. is the first step mm. in actually improving the doctor-patient ratio. Don't you think a carpet bombing solution would be to just produce more doctors in India? Um, the problem is that when you produce more doctors... Um, the doctors, I mean, see, I, I wanted to become a hepatologist and I became a hepatologist. What if I could not get into hepatology, right? And I become, uh, I mean, I'm at, I'm at an MBBS level and, uh, you know, there are so many MBBS doctors and you don't, you don't actually, you can't actually get them to that level there. They actually really want to get to. So just, just having a lot of doctors doesn't solve the solution problem because we want doctors to cater to area of need. Hmm. Right. So there are a lot of MBBS doctors and they'll be trained from different, different places. And they have um, a lot of them won't have idea about dealing with a particular disease condition. Right. right. And they might actually misinform the patients. So we will have more patients generated from that group. Yeah. So I think it has to be uh, realistically 
uh, this is why there is this thing called matching in the us and all they have a system where they match where these people want they'll give their options this is my first option second option third option and depending on that they get matched with their credits and their other you know uh, other other uh, credentials and all that uh, here i mean i i got through my hepatology dm after 2 years of trying i mean after my mbbs and md uh, there are people who write it for about 4 years trying to get into a super specialty course fail and then they just you know they just work because they have to work to earn money yeah so it becomes like that it does not actually become something needful catering to the population they are just there because they are going to work i'll give you a very outside non medico perspective and i have a lot of friends who are in medicine i dated a doctor once upon a time <laughs> okay. so i i have a very detailed understanding of medical colleges at least in maharashtra okay uh, and again this is not a reservation debate or anything like that that's a whole other conversation yeah. you know which has nuances on both sides I and understand. i don't think there's one correct answer because the reason that reservations exist in um government colleges is because it was what was best for the country at the time of independence and i don't think the caste problems in our country are solved yet yeah. there is a lot of people from so called lower caste in rural india who are living a very difficult life and i think when the reservation uh, based system was created it was keeping in mind the transition of those people so i've had lawyers come on the show and say that now it should not be a caste based reservation but it should be a financial strata based reservation in yes. terms of you could have someone of a so called higher caste who's from not a very well to do family who will actually get the priority into yeah. so, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so admission I mean, in medical and yeah. engineering so i mean i'm not going to into the discussion on that part i mean this is what uh, anti reservation community always talks about it has to be the financial uh, level of this thing uh but at the moment uh, as long as we are a very heterogeneous community or a very heterogeneous population with so many differences in tradition culture and everything uh, i think the reservation system still works to some extent uh, uh it may or may may or may not change in the future yeah. but and we have plus and minus to it like like we have strong opinions on other sides of healthcare also yeah. you know you have alternative medicine there you have uh, scientific medicine here and it's 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 a debate that will i think mature uh, at some point in time yeah. and uh, uh, regarding the uh, colleges uh, in maharashtra i mean uh, i think you are on that topic uh, yeah i i was basically saying that i remember in my 11th and 12th uh, there was a lot of brilliant students with me uh, who didn't get into the medical college of their choice uh, even though they got better marks than someone from the same financial strata but who belonged to a so called lower caste okay and then got into the college in terms of the person who was t- making use of the caste based admission okay. was from the same kind of financial background but used it uh, as a ticket to get into college with, with lower marks a better college yeah a better college there are four government colleges in bombay yeah. uh, jj km sian and nayar okay. at least at that time I'm, i okay. don't know if it's the same i mean right still now. the big players even now i think yeah, yeah so uh, i mean i can look at it uh in a different way sure so um you know in the medical science field in clinical medicine uh see i am an average student uh so in my 8th i think i failed math i was good in biology and uh, in 11th and 12th i barely got through i had to waste or sit for about 18 months to get into my mbbs that is a bachelor's degree and then after my mbbs i had to waste another uh, i mean i had to sit uh, sit another one and a half years to get into my md course and then after my md i, I took at least 2 years to get into my dm course i was an average student i mean nothing great about it and i got into uh, in my mbbs i did from st john's medical college a very rigorous uh, program uh, in md i got into government medical college but like you said i wanted uh, somewhere in Uh, delhi like gb pand or you know safdarjang or all in institute um, but ultimately uh, i got into a college in uh, calcutta so i studied at nilratan sarkar medical college fantastic college huge government college lot of cases and ultimately in dm i did from delhi that is i institute of liver and biliary sciences which is one of the best here um, so what i'm trying to say is that if somebody wants to become a good doctor or excel in that practice I don't think the college or where you study mm-hmm. actually matters. Wow. It's your mindset. Like for example, um, why do 
people become doctors if you are if you if you ask somebody this question uh, they would give you the same parroting answers oh it's a noble profession i want to serve the community you know that that kind of stuff uh, which which works out everywhere but the real answers to that what i understand is that one it's a profession it brings you money it does not bring you the real money that you want of course not but it makes you comfortable at the level where where you are specialist or super specialist or practicing in a good place with a good practice the second part to it is that it all depends on how you want to take your career forward for example see i could be a 9 to 5 doctor i go to a corporate hospital see patients 9 to 5 see maximum number of patients that i can so that i can get a commission out of it also because corporate hosp- hospitals do that you know mm-hmm. at some point they'll give you targets and if you go beyond the target they'll give you more money so i can work like that and i can promote myself that i mean i'm doing this i'm doing that and i can promote myself but doctors are not supposed to do that they're not supposed to promote as per the ethics code but still is uh, it illegal it is it, it is not legal yeah it is illegal so i cannot come on the show and say that you know i'm this doctor i'm doing this i'm doing this i'm work i mean, i cannot i cannot do that i cannot sell my uh profession on on social media and all that that's against the law but that that is one way you can become a doctor and do what a doctor does the second is to actually become an academic doctor so i think all doctors must become academic which makes their uh, profession and career meaningful mm. right so somebody says that i did not see i i studied from very average colleges except the last one the last one is a very good college and i was very lucky to get in because i i mean i i worked really hard for it and it's it's that hard work that puts you there and ultimately what you become is your choice what what you lose if if you have a door closed another door opens mm. you can make the best out of it so i have had my uh, so we are, we are a batch i mean if you look at my mbbs batch we are about 60 people 30 girls and 30 guys and if you look at my batch a lot of them are actually abroad they have done their usmle they have done their plab and they have done their you know uk and us all those things and they have gone abroad and they are in good positions there very few people have uh, stayed behind including myself and the reason why i wanted this was that uh, see even if i did not get through uh, a good college uh, i always had the advice and support how to become a good doctor it's, it's not about a good college it's about how a good doctor you are so if you are going to make the lives of 10 people better in a month that's that's really satisfying mm. so if you look at patients as humans treat them with compassion ethics empathy and be communicative you'll see that every doctor's practice is meaningful the college doesn't matter at all no i love that you're saying that and i'll tell you why because in engineering we are told if you don't get into iit or bits or one of the top colleges your career is over oh. i also went to, to a very average college uh but engineering paid off in the long term yeah uh, and i wish i could go to every 11th and 12th standard student in the country and tell them study hard try your best but if you don't this get the it. best college it's fine yeah. because life begins after 22 you, according to me that's exactly what i'm saying i'm just an average person sitting in front of you i mean mm-hmm. i have never had a stellar uh, school performance i never had a stellar uh, medical per- medical college performance i'm an average guy but i knew that this is what this profession wants from me and this is what the patient needs from me yeah just deliver that and you're good to go coming back to that overarching conversation about medical college entrances i always felt like even if the person was smart the cutoffs in medical college entrance at least in maharashtra were too high okay and yeah. that was because of a lack of good government colleges mm. in mumbai so my engineering mind gave me the solution that why don't they just open more education based departments in other hospitals uh, all over the country in terms of not every hospital has a college within it yeah uh, i'm sure there are challenges i'm not a medical student so i don't even know what medical college yeah. is like but i would assume that it's not extremely difficult to create a student wing within big private hospitals as well that's one part of my angle okay uh, the second is we had someone called pratham mittal on the show who's one of the faces of new age education in india he runs something called masters union which is okay. like a alternative mba program okay and their outcome is basically that they place people in great jobs with good, great pay packages i've gone to masters union myself okay and there is a good um, kind of outcome that i saw at the end of that okay uh he told me that private education is actually the long term solution for all of india's education related problems because of the size of a country you can't expect any government that will ever be in power 
to solve all the problems in one shot even this new education policy that's coming out mm-hmm. uh we had dr radhakrishnan pillay on the show who was a part of drafting it yeah. and the bottom line of that uh podcast was that he said it will take 25 30 years for all of it to actually be applied it's that's like true uh because here uh, the two points that you made so important one is that having a educational poly, uh, educational functionally educational area within private sectors and uh, second is a parallel program that you said we have that so in medicine uh we have a major national board that is your university under the government recognized universities and then we have a parallel body known as the uh that that is that, that is the body that gives the dnb degree that is a diplomate of national board so we have a national board and then we have a government approved board so the national board is also an autonomous board that gives out diplomate in specialty and super specialty so if you have a specialty course it is known as dnb and then if it's super special it is known as drnb so there is a parallel university the parallel board there so people who don't get into md courses or dm courses which are actually the university related courses they can actually opt for dnb courses in private hospitals so my the hospital where i work so i am not part of the hospital i am not employed by rajagiri hospital i have a consultancy group and a group of us doctors provide um uh, you know tertiary level services to tertiary care hospitals that's what we do so they not we are not paid by rajagiri hospital uh so we have a dnb program there in rajagiri so under me we have i have three students now who are doing uh, a dnb program in gastroenterology so they have finished their mbbs they have finished their md degree or dnb degree in internal medicine general medicine and now into super specialty in gastroenterology but it is not the dm degree which the universities give it is the drnb degree which the diplomate board gives now this is good in a way that you can accommodate more people to go into the super specialty stream and you can cater to the super specialty stream and wherever needed eventually will those people be of the same quality this is the problem so this depends on where they are being taken up so for example uh, ima- there are a lot of private hospitals now running dnb programs and a lot of them are run for labor force so they have these programs so called programs for educational degree that is a dnb or drnb but they look at those students as labor force so they want people to work night shifts they want people to do documentation they want people to make discharge summaries and ultimately most of the programs in a smaller level private hospitals become like uh, labor force and they come out i mean with a degree but with very poor knowledge of patient skills communication and treatment and i have seen this because i am teaching dnb students and i am seeing a lot of dnb students who do not pass their exams and i train them to give when before their exams and a lot of them are have very l- low levels of actual uh, knowledge regarding super specialty level of patient and and most of the most of them are from dnb programs never from dm programs is there a solution here the solution is to i mean the solution is to ensure that how that academic program is uh, oriented in that particular hospital so for example i can speak for my hospital uh, this is we have an academic section separate we have a guy in charge of the academics we have a guy in charge of the program we have a guy in charge of uh, education uh, topics everything and i am also a, a teacher i do bedside and rounds teaching and it's everything is in place like just like a proper university program but in many other colleges we don't have such a situation they just come in the morning they'll just go for rounds and after that they'll go home or they go for the i studio or whatever they don't get they don't teach them anything mm. so this this i think it it all of this has to go from uh, one place to another in a uh, what do you call in a homogeneous fashion every in- institute must must consider these students as students not as their labor force mm. got it you know i have clinically diagnosed adhd so in my head that scene from munna vai is playing where he goes jj hospital <laughs> rl <laughs> anyway sorry i had to just say that hey if you enjoyed today's clip make sure you check out all the other clips we've uploaded on this channel you'll find a clip related to almost every single topic as long as you're willing to search for it